sixth iteration of dance and poetic series that the Kelly Writers House has generously allowed me to do here for the last three years. Our previous ones, which you can find archived online, were Dance and the Poetics of Fatigue. We had two sessions that were Dance and the Poetics of Diaspora. In the fall, we had Italian choreographer Elisa Zuppini here doing Dance and the Poetics of Proximal Distance. And I'm so delighted tonight to be able to introduce all of you to Taka, who is here from Portland um, for Dance and the Poetics of Nothingness. So before we start, I just wanted to give thanks to Jessica Popkin, Heidi, Allison, Zach, and all of the folks at Kelly Writers House. It really takes a whole village to get one of these productions going, and Kelly Writers House is always really generous, really efficient, and really hospitable. So thanks. So I'll just read a brief intro for Taka, and then I'll give a few brief words about me, and then we'll dive into the presentation that Taka has for us. So Takahiro Yamamoto is originally from Shizuoka, Japan. He's an artist and a choreographer based in Portland, Oregon, and he has received support from NCC Akron, Boliasco Foundation, the Oregon Community Foundation, the McDowell Foundation, the National Performance Network, Japan Foundation, Portland Institute for Contemporary Art. Actually, there are so many of these because Taka's just been very successful, so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, he holds an MFA in Visual Studies from Pacific Northwest College of Art, and he co-directs the performance company Madhouse with Ben Evans and is part of a Portland-based support group, oh. Physical Education, Save with Ali Hankins, Kayon Gaskin, and Lou Yim. And I'm Dahlia Lee. I'm a PhD student in the Department of English. I'm also a uh, arts and creative writer and a dance maker myself. Taka and I met last spring through NCC Akron's choreographic retreat, and we've had a kind of ongoing collaboration that's trying to figure out how you make art and talk about things at the intersection of nothingness, dance, and different kinds of projected identities that the body has to negotiate. So please join me in welcoming Taka to Kelly Writer's House. Okay. Maybe I'll just sit here. OK. Oh, whoa, microphone. Hi. <laughs> um, I am going to talk about nothingness. But before I do that, I also want to talk about voice and breathing and what I've been thinking about. So a long time ago, maybe 15, 20 years ago, my mentor in classical theater acting a uh, voice for acting teacher was telling me that speaking is an act, it's a pleasurable act. So as she's teaching about speaking and voice, she was talking about how it activates the muscles and nerves and bones through vibration in various ways. And that vibration is something that we should be thinking about as a pleasure. And that never left me. So when voicing means experiencing internal vibration, that I think about hearing voice, which that means experiencing external vibration. And there's something visceral and emotional about that. So as I'm thinking about this voice, I'm also thinking about breathing and I also realized that I never think about breathing because I'm often busy with doing, thriving, accomplishing, and living. And as exciting and as stimulating as it is, it, this breathing makes, it makes my breathing autopilot. So it's kind of like when I'm too busy to eat, I think about food as just the fuel for living but you never get to actually enjoy what I'm eating. That's, what, that's the similar uh, dichotomy I was thinking about. So if breathing becomes a tool and machine for me to do all these things, I want, maybe I need to switch that and maybe I let my actions and ambitions and communication be based on the breath. So I've been experimenting this idea of breathing recently in my work. So, <clears throat> 
I think about letting my voice carry through the breath. I think about weaving the voice into the breath. For that, I want to acknowledge the cyclical cycle of, cycle of breathing, like a cycle of inhale and exhale, a cycle of life, a cycle of filling and emptying, a cycle of presence and nothingness, a cycle of life and death, a cycle of in and out. I enjoy, th I enjoy thinking about the idea of cycle in this, uh, honoring the space in between two, these two polarities. In a way, these uh, polar ideas are merely a point in line of the circle rather than the destination, or two points in polar line. And I also want to highlight the space in between presence and nothingness, a place where, the, where we exist and don't exist at the same time, a place where nothingness is part of our presence, a place where life and death coexist. So having, all sa having said all that, if you are interested, um, I would like to facilitate this quick breathing and voice exercises that I usually do with my collaborators. Um, this is how we start, and I often use that as a, f a choreographic material sometimes. So if you <coughs> sit on the edge of the chair, and if you place your feet, so, I mean, this, hold on. So what you're doing is you're creating a, a tripod between two legs and your butt. And feel the length of your neck. And relax the back of your eyeballs. And relax your jaws. Relax your shoulder. And breathe in with your nose and out with your mouth. And place one hand on your diaphragm and the other back of your, uh, like around here, maybe. And think about when you breathe in, the diaphragm is like a balloon that goes 360 degrees. So it goes down, up, front, and back. What you're experiencing now it's just a sagittal line of front and back. In the back side, it might be hard to find that expansion. But if you think about the mind and body connection, if you consciously think about the back, you might be able to find that expansion in the back. and switch hands. <sighs> and let go of your hand and keep breathing in that way. And now I'm going to invite you to place a voice as you inhale and exhale. If you think about exhale as vibrations coming through space and think about a voice that gets placed on the breath and just tiny little bit, for example, I would do Uh, 
just tiny little ha. But that ha should be as you do less with it. You don't make a sound, just place it. Ha. Ha. And if you feel that, <coughs> then maybe you can also put two hus. Ha ha. Ha ha. Ha ha. So in a way, you're weaving the voice and the breath together, but you're not vocalizing. Voice is just a part of the breath. Ha, ha. Ha. Cool. Thank you. Relax. You can relax if you want. <laughs> I'm going to relax. <laughs> so I'm going to, <clears throat> I want to share more about the idea of nothingness, but I'm going to honor my in, in, uh, inhale. So my initial proposition for this project, Nothing Being, was based on my desire to delve into the idea of pure being and existence, exploring a more nuanced approach to the idea of nothingness beyond absence and dismissibility. Eventually, through several rehearsal residencies last year, this project has manifested itself as one that centers around the intentional experience of pure being, extensive conversations about each subjective reflection of our lives, and a cultivation of deep trust among participating artists. David Thompson, Anna Martin Whitehead, and myself, along with thought partner Samita Singha. I want to take time to list these people's name and their energy here because they are very important for me to really delve into this idea with a trust and safety. Today, I'm going to briefly share my thoughts on the idea of nothingness. And I have always thought there is something too simple and easy to merely define nothingness as the negation of things, or actions, or presence. But living in the States, somehow this idea of nothingness has always been that. It's the absence and dismissibility. But yet, maybe because I grew up in different country, or maybe has a Buddhist undertake, un undertone to it. But the concept of nothingness is part of everything, I thought, in contrast with considering it as a polar opposite of presence. Maybe it is more of a mental state, a starting point, or a foundation of everything I do and feel in the world. Again, I can't pinpoint where and how I learned to think that way, but it has become more pronounced as I've been living in the States more than 20 years at this point. 
And as I immerse myself into American society, I have noticed that this word nothing is an insult that people use to call somebody. And that also indicates the lack of value as well as its worth. This reflects my feelings about an unspoken social pressure, which tells me that what matters in life, perhaps under capitalism, is the claim, certification, verification of some things. Like accomplishments, talents, status, skills, experiences, mileage, acknowledgements, measured time, and the amount of stuff that you know. I admit that I too notice myself assessing others through that lens from time to time. The fact that my immigration status is based on a multitude of paperwork and decennial renewal of documents attest to this. So if a thing is not something, then the natural next step is to dismiss it. The word nothing is often used to, used to mean dismissible and not noteworthy. And yet I recognize that I am also wound up wanting to accomplish, complete, and fulfill something in life. I am also impatient in passively waiting proactively working at finding ways to carry through projects in life or communicating other people to let them know that I exist. The projects such as artistic productions, writings, house projects, hobbies, recipes for new dishes, workout routines, or what have you. As a matter of fact, I recognize my drive to Grasp, its, um, grasp this unfamiliar philosophical inquiry like nothingness as something to do to be fulfilled in my life. So I did a lot of research and that's something. I also want to be somebody so that others might take my words, actions, and existence seriously. Being dismissed and disregarded is incredibly impactful, leaving strong marks in my memory. Being erased feels like part of my life at this point, and I don't like it. But it's hard for me to forget those moments, reminding myself to strive harder. Maybe that's part of human survival. And I'm trying to wrap my head around the relationship between my something-oriented drive and deeper meaning of nothingness in my life. Ah, too much. Ah, get away. Rather than simply not doing or negating the drive for some things, I want to incorporate the state of nothingness in my life as reminding myself of its value and existence. Are there any approach to celebrate a drive for something, not out of fear of being nothing or dismissed, but along with the recognition and appreciation of nothingness in life? Philosopher Kitaro Nishida, who I just found out online accidentally, but he has this idea of absolute nothingness, a place between the positive and the negative, between having and not having, a place where everything exists beyond the recognition of conflicts, polarity, and contradiction. It is not about the lack of meaning, being or function. It is a place where there is no distinction, recognition, or decoding of the situation or the self. 
he says this experience of absolute nothing is called pure experience. An experience before we assign a relationship between the subject, like seer and experiencer, and the object of being seen and experienced. An experience where both are mixed together. The directness and the purity of pure experience derive not from experiences being simple, unanalyzable, or instantaneous, but from the strict unity of concrete consciousness. That's a quote from Nishida. I resonate with this articulation of the sequence of time, how everything starts from nothing, like pure experience, and then, as a human, we recognize the situation, realize our subjective perception, and identify the social role. For example, if I look at the chair, he says there is a pure experience, there could be a pure experience where that chair and I could exist without me recognizing and identifying that that's a chair, meaning is this. This is an object that you sit down. Are there a moment before I, in encounter, where we can just experience as it is? So this separation between pure experience and recognition and consciousness is very simply put. But those two things involve completely different mental states. But it is also easily easy to merge the two or ignore the pure experience, at least for me. I plan my day with looking at my Google Calendar with intentional and carefully thought out and planned activities, or I have to teach a class at 11 o'clock, there's a time restriction, everything, or I, I have to eat, so I plan, look for a restaurant, I plan to go there. There is an intended outcomes, reasons, goals, and fulfillment, which I can think of it as some things. Oftentimes, those intentions are not only coming from an internal space, like my ego, ambition, productivity, survival, or self-esteem, but they're also influenced by my consideration of what other people would think of me. That's the sociality, social aspect that I wanted to point out. How society, society or how other people would see me, how many guards and protections I have to put up in order to survive in the world because of what I look like. As I spend more time on this earth, I do notice myself not caring about what other people think as much as before. I was told that that's a midlife situation, <laughs> which is great. But <laughs> I also wonder if this tendency of caring about others is cultural or inherited. For example, my father, who is 78 at this point, he was telling me that he would walk outside in a neighborhood in Japan with his mask on, even though there was no one on the street. And he knows that scientific research says there is little to no risk of, risk of infection in a non-crowded outside area. But he does this because he doesn't want other people to worry. He doesn't want other people to think that he can be a threat. And I would laugh and make fun of him on the phone. And yet I also embarrassingly emphasize, empathize with him because I deeply understand where he's coming from. In a way, I attribute this state of self-consciousness to an attempt to achieve or execute something. So the question is, do I get to allow myself to be absorbed into an activity, action, or state without the fear of being dismissed 
without the drive to achieve something, without the pressure to prove myself to others, or without the need to protect myself? Do I ever get to let go of my self-consciousness? And with that question, I'm going to show you an excerpt of Nothing Being. I don't think whatever we are, I'm talking about, I don't know. Well, maybe I shouldn't say anything. Let's watch that. <laughs> Also, I will tell you that this exercise of breathing in and out and speaking will give you so much oxygen in your brain, which is kind of making you kind of high, and I love it. Thank you. For this next portion, I'd like to invite everybody to start by just closing their eyes. So as you're closing your eyes, you might be able to tune into that sensation of breath that you were getting before. When your eyes are closed and, you know, I'm giving you instruction, but there's no real demand for you to do anything. I can't really see what you're doing. 
without the absence of a demand, maybe I'm just a little voice in your head, how do you know that you're you? What does your body feel like? So when I think about this question of working with nothingness or composing nothing being, one thing that always comes up for me is how pleasurable sometimes it is to pursue, pursue obscurity, to feel anonymity, to not have the pressure of being a something. At the same time, every time I have these compositional impulses, or even sometimes at night when I'm laying down in my bed, just breathing, just feeling, there's this moment where I realize that I'm gonna have to open my eyes at some point. At some point, I have to ask for legibility. I have to be able to declare who I am, maybe because I need a certain kind of government certification, because I want somebody to respond to me in some way. It's the conundrum that in order to get legibility, you actually have to lose that pleasure of obscurity. How do you know for yourself when you're just experiencing anything or nothing or something for you? How do you know that you're inside of obscurity or anonymity as something that you might want? How do you identify your own desire for nothingness? Where nothingness is not a bad thing, it's not the absence of a presence, it's simply a certain state and it's a state that we might want sometimes. As we grow up, we learn to organize ourselves into proper people. We learn how to speak properly, we learn how to present ourselves, as we learn narratives about other people who are like us or that we identify with, we begin to understand how to situate ourselves in a map of the world. This is the will to become a social something. Every time you try to recall a memory, even if you don't have to make it into a social something, you do a little operation where you're trying to organize senses, sensations, and memories into a form. You think of this as the something of trying to remember. Every single day when we move through life, we're allowing different kinds of sortings to happen. Things get sorted into a slot or a category. How we usually know that something isn't working is when we cling on to something dear because it can't be sorted into one of the given organizations. Nothing actually tells us the most about when something doesn't work. That's because something doesn't have a language, doesn't have a form for that nothing that we hold most dear. Check in again with your experience of breathing, with your body, with the state, with the sensation that you have when you're allowed to remain in an experience of nothing or of obscurity. So as someone that has acquired a lot of some things in life, those some things can be lines on a CV, they can be money, they can be material things, they can be accomplishments. Something I find to be something that creates a hoarder's problem. It's too cluttered. As a trained dancer, I've recently developed a very different relationship to technique. When I was just starting dancing in my 20s, which I felt was late, I was always chasing after technique. I wanted to have the leg extension. I wanted to do four turns. I wanted to be able to do splits. Some of these somethings I got, and some of them I didn't. But the second I acquired a something, when I mastered a technique, I didn't want it anymore. 
When you have too many things, you crave nothing again. Recently, instead of trying to throw everything away, I've been trying to develop a different relationship to the some things that I have. What if something isn't actually a thing I can hold on to, but something is just a technique? That some things are just a way that I've learned to organize, not so that I can receive something, but so that I can experience the world in a certain way. The question I'm always working with is how do you hold on to nothing when it really doesn't want to be held on to? How does your hand that's so used to grasping at things and holding on to things actually encode another way of experiencing, of finding nothing? So you can keep your eyes closed for a second and can I get the tech people in the back to start playing that video I loaded up? So as you want to, you can start opening your eyes, but before you do, see what happens if you can hold on to that sensation of nothingness, knowing that you can't really hold on to it. But maybe your body can have an experience of a different mode as you open your eyes and you have to let go of your nothingness and watch this little video. So this video is the first of a number of what I call reverse photography experiments I've been doing, and it's loading. <laughs> Flant! No, it wasn't. Um, let's see. Okay, well, it's reloading again. Um, so what I was working with is the notion that a photographic negative actually maybe isn't a negative, or how does the you know, the process of developing a photographic negative reveal another mode or possibility for nothingness. So my parents came to suburban Salt Lake City from southern China in the beginning of the 90s and the end of the 80s. And they had very, very little money, but because they had family in China, one of the things they had to do was an establish and a connection. So when they did save up money, the first big purchase item they made was of a cam was a camera. And so in a closet next to my parents' bedroom, there's hundreds of photographic negatives because my parents were constantly taking pictures of things, pictures that sometimes look like pictures of nothing, particularly when you're like, oh, this is suburban Salt Lake City. 
So the history of photography is before it gets uploaded into these little things, um, photography was a very mysterious medium. And that word medium is important because at first when people were doing photographs, they thought that maybe they were able to capture images of ectoplasm. So photographs, because of their ability to pick up different kinds of light waves and sensitivities, were capturing a view into a nothing world that we normally couldn't see anymore. So photography was really magical. And so looking back on these hundreds of photographs of what feels like nothing that my parents took when they first came to Salt Lake City, um, I just tried to come up with explanations. I've done critical race studies, I've done lots of oral history research. There are all these narratives that I can put onto that period when my parents were here. Their lives could be used to narrate race and racism in the 90s. It could be used to narrate a certain chapter of Chinese diasporic history. But every time I look at these photographs, and each time I look at them, I have a new note of history. The photographs still persist somehow. There's something that all of this knowledge can't really get to or explain away. And so three or four years ago, I started doing these projects where I would try to trace out the photographic negatives to find different hints of things and then to develop them in different liquids like oils. And I don't really have a thing to call this, but I just wanted to share it as um, a kind of companion practice to the one that Taco was sharing. When you feel like there is just too many somethings, what can you actually do to turn back the relationship of something and nothing? How do you find nothing to be the thing that's more abundant? And how do you actually discover nothingness to have far more material and far more ability to do things than all of the frames for somethingness that we have? So that was a bit abstract, but I wanted to be able to fill the room with a lot of material because I'm going to ask Taka to now join me at the front of the room oh. for a little bit of a conversation. And while we're having our conversation, I want to invite you to think of any questions you might have for us too. Um, I think in about five minutes, we'll open it up to Q&A or comments where we can let nothing fill the room. Taka, just let me know when you're plugged in, turned. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. So the first question I have for you, Taka, is what's the difference between solitude and isolation and nothingness? And so, you know, there's a really broad way to think about this, but the reason I asked this of you specifically is I saw the performance in Portland in the fall. And one of the things that happens is towards the end of the piece, Taka, when I saw it, has this really intense experience of, I don't know if it's nothingness or not, but it feels like your body's actually able to not have to sit inside the frame of the performance anymore. It gets to a point where it's just doing a kind of unanticipated movement, which isn't improvisation. It actually feels like it's touched upon a different kind of force. Mm. And then right after you do that, um, David especially has to come over and pat you on the back, All right. hold your hand, and it feels like there's a kind of comforting going on. Mm. So it feels like something happens there where your body touches a nothingness, and then in order to come back into the scene of everyday life or the scene of the concert stage, you actually require somebody else there. Um, well, the... Great question, thank you. <laughs> That's also a contentious question in the team. Uh, no contentious. I, my, I think, I, I sometimes think solitude is uh, relational. Solitude is achieved for me in my life when other people give me space to do it. Mm. And if I'm just by myself and give myself solitude, then the aloneness is already a default. 
so there's not much of a weight to the idea of solitude. So for that performance, I need to, I keep saying this phrase, I want to forget that they're watching me and they are there for me, but I cannot do what I do without them being there. So I can feel, I can trust that whatever happened to me, somebody is going to help me. <laughs> um, the David coming to touch me or, uh, is actually my request. Hmm. So each solo moment, we talk about aftercare. How do you want to come back? What, is, what do you want from us is what basically is a question. And I said I need somebody to remind me with the physical touch that I am not alone. That's why David comes in <laughs> and uh, yeah, do that for me. Yeah, did that answer? Yeah, it makes me think too, what's the relationship between permission and nothingness? Yeah. And I, the other, one of the reasons I asked this is Taka and I have had a long conversation around how do you make art when very obviously you look Asian? <laughs> <laughs> in the US or like the funding streams or the presentation are kind of highlighting like these are Asian queer makers and you kind of accept that but then again like that imposition doesn't really explain anything about the work mm. and so the reason I asked about permission is that often feels like when you're making work within a particular group you do actually need somebody to give you the permission to not have to represent anymore. Oh, that's nice. Yes, thank you. <laughs> you need to be given the permission to do nothing or given the permission to explore nothing Yeah. because you've already been summoned to do something. I like that. Yes. I also know that even if I go to that state and I get to do the nothing, I'm sure that after the event, I'm sure other people put some identity lens onto it anyway. And I'm, I decided that I don't, I'm not going to care about something that I have no control over. Did you need to be given permission for that kind of, I don't care? Like where did, because I know earlier you talked about like there was a shift something midlife yeah. or something. Is that midlife crisis? I don't know. Well, let's not talk about it as a crisis. <laughs> <laughs> but where did you find the permission to be able to do that? I think, oh, you know, I was talking with somebody about this uh, here. When I moved to the States, I didn't know that I was Asian because the idea of Asian meant different when I was in Japan because of the whole imperial a history when I'm in Japan, Asian means everybody else near that region, which means everybody else who Japan tried to occupy <laughs> in the early 1900s. So there was a history to it. So I didn't think of myself as Asian, but maybe like four or five years later, as I'm experiencing the racial dynamic in the States, and I had this realization that, oh, fuck, nobody cares about my nobody cares about my nationality or my blood. Mm -hmm. The racism in Japan is based on the bloodline, but racism here is what you look like. So it made sense of the uh, student protests in the 70s in Berkeley where Asians tried to get together and have an affiliation because if you look a certain way, then the hatred will come to you anyway. And that's when I got this weird permission for myself mm. that I don't need to claim who I am all the fucking time because I can't, I have no control over it. Mm. I'm sorry, I'm cursing. <laughs> sorry. Yes, I didn't mean to. Yes. It's okay, it's after 5 p.m. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you for the permission. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> And I guess the last question I have before we open it up to the floor then is there's a lot of stuff that restricts us as social beings, like social life. Um, 
So just focusing again on the annoying things around identity, what kinds of permission has being coded as Asian in America or being coded as queer given you in terms of a performance oh practice or a nothing practice? Do you have an answer to that question? <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, one of them is actually knowing that the history of Asian American is that it's a term that, as you said, people came up with in the 1970s. It's understanding that it's both a fiction and a way of practicing politics or a way of organizing people who otherwise maybe don't have intimacies with each other to speak to one right, another. Right. Um, it's also the permission, knowing the history of Asian American, um, the stereotype around Asian American or around Asia is quiet or Confucianism, mystique, enigma. But the history of Asian American as a term is all about political agitation. Yeah. So that paradox is itself a kind of permission for me to know like, oh, you can actually work both things mm. and they're necessary for you to be able to make that identity have a meaning for yourself or other people. Um, queerness gives you a lot of permission. Some of them oh are before God, yes. 5 p.m. and some are after 5 p.m. privileges. <laughs> oh my God, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um... I don't know. That's a very... Well, you know, um, <clears throat> the spa shooting was two years ago, correct? When that happened, some of my friends get together and created this Zoom meeting where we can talk about your experience that happened and I didn't know most of the people except two in that group and it was a diverse Asian there's a mixed race Cambodian Indonesian South Asian Korean Vietnamese me Japanese and yeah it was an amazing mix of people That, as I was like studying about my, the Asian American history, I realized that all these groups are trying to not be the other person, not be the other Asian mm. in this history. Like when Chinese Exclusion Act was saying, it's like, oh, I'm not Chinese. Right. <laughs> Japanese internment, I'm not Japanese, don't take me there. Vietnamese refugee comes in and then I'm not Vietnamese, you know, like there is mm -hmm. always that we are not that. We're the good Asian, not the we bad are the, Asian. Exactly. And that group that I was talking about, talking with, I was like, oh, wow, this is kind of like the moment as unfortunate as the incident was, I was feeling, oh, I don't have to distinguish myself depending on my blood or nationality mm. in this group and that affiliation was so I don't know it was very uh, empowering mm. for me and also I don't know if that relates to your permission question but it make me feel it it make me feel like we are very different, but also still in the room together. And that sense was quite um, mm. nice, which I haven't experienced before. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question. No, it's a beautiful response. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Questions from people in the audience at all? We have a wireless, wireless mic. mic. <laughs> The technology in here is amazing. I know, amazing. right? <laughs> Look Ivy at League universities. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. When you were talking, Taka, when you were talking about um, pure experience, mm. it made me think of deep listening and yes. Pauline Oliveris' practice, which is, I mean, the, the idea is to take in sound w without identifying mm -hmm. what it is. I mean, you know, our, our inclination is mm -hmm. to want to make meaning out of any, you know, any sensation. And, um, 
and, and the, the intention is to, um, not for it to be momentary, mm. but to be able to extend for mm. across a period of time the ability to just take in sound without the, you know, feeling the compulsion to make meaning mm. of it. Mm -hmm. How does that, um, how, how is that similar? Or how does it diverge from your, um, your understanding of pure experience? I think um, because we have Samita Singha, a friend who is a vocalist based in New York, is involved in this production. So we did some voice uh, exercise when Samita was virtually facilitating <laughs> for us. There is, a, uh, there is a moment that she was saying how uh, le allow the body to do its job. Don't think about what you're about. Don't mm -hmm. intentionally do something. So that's similar to the meaning making part. And Pauline Olivero, um, its name came up because David has a very extensive relationship with that practice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the. What's interesting about that, maybe that's probably why we have a lot of voice and vocalization in the practice. And we didn't mean to be, it just came out that way. Um, I, the pure experience is so theoretically and conceptually very enticing but I also want to acknowledge the fact that when you get to it and you can easily manipulate and if you only think about pure experience and everybody can have it, then the phrasing like all lives matter comes in. Mm -hmm. Everybody's the same. When you only think about pure experience, then you're also easily manipulated. So for example, when the idea came up in the 1920s and 30s, that philosopher was the most well-read, like a New York Times bestseller kind of thing mm. <laughs> for, uh, for Japanese male back then who were, who get to the point where it's easy to, mm, they got brainwashed into believing that protecting the country by like protecting the country is the most important thing because you get to the pure experience and if you have no judgment criticality of judging or making meaning or finding meaning for other people then it can be very vulnerable and also scary place too and I in terms of subordinate and group, the subordinate identity that we inhabit, I sometimes think about why do, I, why do we need not get to experience the pure experience? What is preventing us from not letting ourselves be, like giving ourselves the permission to feel that? And Pauline's mm -hmm. practice has this collective feel and she creates the space where you can do it. Or she goes to the cave <laughs> and create, go to the situation, the site, and say, okay, this is where you can do this. But you can't live in that Pauline Olivero mindset every day because you have to defend yourself, protect yourself from other people. Did I answer your question? I just went all, the, all <laughs> over the place. But I, I'm, just, I'm just thinking about like a pure experience and Pauline's practice can be very dangerous um, because you do lose yourself. And this work is all about me losing myself or me not having a self-consciousness. But when you don't have a self-consciousness, then it can be a scary place to be. That's why I'm also like, 
sometimes question the postmodern dance of being neutral thing. The idea, sometimes I question it because who get to be neutral when our body is never neutral? Feels like there's an and question there too. Like, can you have pure experience and awareness of the way the world right. makes it so not everybody accesses pure experience? Yeah. That you don't have to say, because not everybody can have pure experience, nobody gets pure experience. Yeah. Or we only have pure experience. It's sort of, okay, if pure experience is one of the modes of being, what are the other modes we would need to develop so that we're accountable to what we understand about the world? and what we understand about different people's vulnerabilities and risks, mm -hmm. which when I've done things like pure listening or these sorts of performance practices, that state of hyper receptivity of someone who's trans and non-white and often has to feel guarded, being able to get into a state of hyper sensitivity also then makes me really open to other people in a way that sometimes I'm not. So I start to learn about other people's risks and vulnerabilities too, yeah. without having it to become like sentimental, like, oh my gosh, they're so pitiful or whatever. But mm. it's like an awareness of, okay, if this is a moment of pure experience, I then ask, why are we not always experiencing this? Mm. And then I can go, oh, because of this, because of this, because of this, because of this. Right, right. Uh, do you identify that? as a place in, in self-consciousness, or do you think about the difference between self-consciousness and self-awareness mm. in relationship to this place of pure experience? I, it made me think about those things when you talked about, I was fascinated by um, the, the extreme self-awareness, self-consciousness, hypersensitivity being a pathway of a kind of awareness and empathy and wondering about how you think about that in relationship to pure experience, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, I mean, one thing for me is as someone who also does like PhD research and just cultural studies and do gender and sexuality studies, whatever, well, uh, like a lot of different kinds of minority studies, um, I can have an experience of something and then immediately feel the insufficiency of how I'm coding it. Like I can go like, well, I would code it, at th code it as this, but then I can go like, oh, that's a product of like the 1980s. Or like with empathy, it's like, that was something that was invented during the 19th century. Like our ex ability to experience other experiences or imagine them have always been around. But the notion that we have to be empathetic human beings and that we have to be able to feel somebody else's pain and that we can, and that somehow leads to a more just society. I know that to be something that was like invented in the 19th century and it has to do with like Christian colonialism. It disregards certain things around race. It disregards like neurodivergence. We don't actually all experience things the same way. So that's maybe one way of saying like, I can experience something that based off of what people say pure experiences and like, I think I'm experiencing that but then how I put it into language or how I start to classify pure experiences relationship to other phenomenon I'm deeply suspicious about for myself. And so that's a kind of critical self-consciousness, which maybe we could say is self-awareness rather than self-consciousness. I hear something around self-consciousness is almost like, um, inhibiting yourself from doing something because you have a worry. Um, and I somehow think that that kind of an inhibition because you're worried of a kind of punishment is different than self-awareness, which is like, oh, maybe I think this thing is everything for everybody else, but actually it's not because I'm me. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking a lot of stuff. Yay. <laughs> like thinking here. Um, let me see, which stuff do I want to <laughs> ask you about? Um, <clears throat> well, one piece of stuff is that I was talking with an artist just a week ago, and she was talking about um, her sense of hopelessness mm. and how much she thinks that that... Um, 
that, you know, that it's not just her, that that's, uh, that's a feeling that's that shared with a lot of people that um, she's around, she's sort of mid-30s or so. Hmm. And, um, and then last night I was, I, was reading, I was reading an article about a new study about um, the, the level of trauma, um, suicide attempts, um, levels of depression and loneliness of, um, of teenage, uh, young teenage American girls. And so, um, you know, I'm thinking, you know, so, you know, what this artist was asking me is how do you, um, she asked me, what's your relationship to hope? And I'm thinking about, you know, what's that space between hopelessness and hope? And how do you navigate that space? And is there any connection between you know, what you're talking about, mm -hmm. you know, be mm -hmm. between, mm -hmm. um, you know, something mm -hmm. and n nothing, or is that space in between, mm -hmm. you know, some expression of nothingness? Hmm. I mean, I have thoughts, Taka, to Go you. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I almost think about it um, through a we have to use a dyad, not pessimism or optimism, but disenchantment and interest. Because, I mean, I often feel hopeless too. I don't now fall into that particular space of like the absence of will or just feeling so helpless. And I think maybe why I navigate that is I can find things to be interested in. And that interest lets me assume other people might be interested in this. And maybe together, like around an interest, other things could emerge. Because it occurs to me that like pessimism and optimism or hope and despair are really extreme, like levels of affect or attachment to things or possibility. And we actually live our lives at a little bit more of a mundane level. Um, and sometimes the intensity of like, oh my gosh, I have to hope, or oh my God, it shattered, creates a level of like emotional exhaustion and fatigue. And so my response is almost, I am probably politically a little bit hopeless, but I do have a lot of interest. And I think I try to live with more attention to interest because moving alongside my interests lets me reserve enough of my like attachment energy or emotional energy to be open to when something else could pop up. Um, I've actually been talking to a lot of friends lately in, I guess America and the conclusion we've come to, and this is people who are between the ages of like 25 and 75, are maybe that the current state of political depression is because there is a bubble that gets created culturally around the 1960s and 70s that was like an optimism of things could be different. And somewhere around like the 90s and 2000s that things could be different optimism started faded away because people were like, oh, actually that kind of change never came. Um, and so when I talk to these friends, we're just figuring out like, okay, if we don't have to live our lives via despair and hope, what are other modes of attachment that make us um, excited or okay to get up um, to find other people and to keep doing things? Mm. Um. No, no, no I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. I think I, I have two answers to it. One is I the way I deal with it is I'm learning, I'm trying to not I'm trying not to rely on my understanding mm. of things. Um, I'm beginning to think that understanding is so overrated. And if I try to understand why I'm hopeless, if I'm trying to understand what hope look like, that understanding, it's like it, it doesn't give me enough, it doesn't give me space to, like the, I'm gonna bring that Edward Glissant, the philosopher again, 
their ideal opacity. And rather than getting caught up in this fear of not knowing, can I actually accept something that it's okay that I don't understand everything? And that gives me some relief. And that to me is in between hope and hopeless. Or, and another answer is I think about my community and my friends and my relationship with them so that the hopelessness and hope doesn't just live in my head. It can be actually in relate. It's like if I focus on the relations that you call the interest, I was thinking curiosity. Mm -hmm. It brings up this curiosity that gives me a drive to wake up in the morning. <laughs> Um, that to me is in between that and sometimes it gets hope hopeful when somebody break my heart it gets hopeless sometimes the news gives me hopelessness and then an episode of will and grace gives me hope i don't know <laughs> um something <laughs> yeah. um, that it, it's yeah it, i also i pay attention to the drive uh, rather than so because i my worst nightmare is to be stuck or being in static state how's that, how's that for you? <laughs> <laughs> so i'm noticing the time and i want to respect how much work kelly writer's house has put into hosting us and so i'm going to oh, yeah. formally adjourn us for now Thank but you. um taka and i will be lurking around in this space for another yeah. five or ten minutes if you want to say hello other questions? Do we have a reception? Great. We also have a reception in the next oh, room that Kelly Writers has oh. prepared for us. So thank you so much, everybody, thank for coming. You so much. It's a pleasure. Okay.